Well, good morning, West Side. How is everybody this fine Sunday morning? We are so glad to see everybody here with us this morning. Uh, we're thankful for those of you who are joining us online. Hey, we just wanted to, we're just here to praise and worship and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why we live and breathe and exist this morning. And we're just, we're here to do that. Uh, we're going to pray and then we're going to get into this great worship set this morning and worship the great God that we all love. Um, so let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning, Jesus, for new life, for for a new day that we have that you've given us to, to praise and honor you. And Lord, we just ask that to the best of our ability, with every fiber of our being, that we do that today. Jesus, we're here to lift your name up. And we claim your promise that when we do that, that you will do the drawing of men and women, boys and girls, to the cross. Help someone, Lord, to find you today in a new and powerful way. Because that's why we're here. We love you, we praise you, we honor you, and we lift your name up, Jesus, and that name above all names whereby we must be saved. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. If you would, stand with me as we begin our time of praise this morning. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there's nothing 
good. The promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Oh, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, right in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Yes, you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you Father, obedient to you, Lord. Father, obedient to 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, it's who's in name I pray this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Jim. Thank you, Praise Team. Y'all can have a seat. Uh, welcome to Westside. We're glad you're here this morning. Just, uh, man, I think the uh, the flu and all the stuff has affected us. I know we've got several people out this morning, but we're glad you're at home. Maybe you're watching online so you can still connect with the body of Christ here this morning. So uh, the welcome, the bulletin there, you see a couple different things there. The announcements, we'll go over those at the end of the service today. But just uh, briefly, <clears throat> you should have a uh, deacon nomination for that was in there and in just a minute before before we do the greeting time we're going to ask that you will um, fill that out <clears throat> and we're going to have our ushers come in just a minute and they will pick that out so while I'm talking you can go ahead uh, and just again you or give you a reminder we are electing deacons to serve a three year uh, term uh, and they will serve here at Westside uh, a deacon must qualify first and foremost by the qualification there found in 1 Timothy 3 uh, verses 8 through 15 Paul gives that explanation there and, and we require as a, as a church here, a body at Westside that uh, they be a, a male who's 18 years or older and a member of Westside Baptist Church. So that's what we're asking you to do. So if, if you will take a minute and just write down some of those uh, men that you know that are serving here. You see the list of the six that are already currently serving as deacons. You can right up to one to three different names on there. Hopefully you've prayed through that and, and felt, you know, led to, to nominate uh, some of these men that you're putting down there. So uh, we'll take those up in just a minute. Uh, also, just want to, you know, touch base with you. This bulletin, the most important thing there is that tear out section right there. Uh, please, if you're visiting with us, if you're a guest with us this morning, just take some time and write uh, your contact information down there on that tear out section. Drop in the offering plate at the end of the service. That's just a record of, of your attendance with us this morning. Uh, the most important thing, though, is on the back side of that, and that's the uh, place for prayer requests. Uh, we love to pray for you any way we can. And, man, y'all been, uh, the last number of weeks, uh, we've gotten a stack of these things in, so I, I appreciate that. That's, that's encouraging to me uh, that you're giving us things to pray for. So take a minute uh, also before the, the service is over this morning, write down any kind of prayer request. You can you can be as general. Some, many people put unspoken. Some people will be specific and write things in there. If you mark it private or confidential, that just goes to me as the pastor, but uh, otherwise we will put those prayer requests in the uh, prayer sheet on Wednesday night and we pray for them as a church, pray for them as staff. So uh, take some time and do that before the, the offering plate's passed at the end of the service. So, so alright, well let's just, before we greet one another, if you will, if, if you've maybe some of you have already done that, you've been in prayer through that, uh, if you will take a minute and just jot down the names that you feel that uh, God is, is, uh, is uh, asking you to nominate and you can just take that paper maybe fold it in half and I'll just ask maybe the ushers to come on down and uh, you guys can start collecting those as as we fill them out so yeah. Jim mentioned Devin uh, uh, just in his prayer a while ago. Uh, Devin will be down here this week. He starts his other part-time job with uh, uh, somewhere here in a business and uh, will be here tonight. Uh, we'll be staying with my wife and I for the week and so we're looking forward to getting to know him a little bit better through that and then I believe he'll be starting here pretty soon at Westside. So uh, I'm getting getting excited about that. So, so uh, But pray for them. They still have a lot of things going on, a lot of things, a lot of parts moving uh, when it comes to that, the, that moving process from, from North Carolina to, to Georgia here. So, all right. Well, let's, um, I think everybody's about done. Um, let's just uh, take a few minutes. Let's uh, stand up and uh, shake a hand, hug a neck, uh, greet, greet each other in the name of the Lord, and then we'll come back for our time of uh, message. So let's greet one another.
Thank you, Zachary. All right. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Um, I feel a little weird this morning. My half of the microphone is missing back here, so if I'm talking, my microphone just flies off. Just laugh at me. So that'll <laughs> no telling. So yeah, if you see a little like a beige-looking wire somewhere on the floor, I don't know what happened to it. So anyway. Uh, all right, well, good morning. We're in uh, Acts chapter 9 again this morning, back in Acts, back in Acts. Uh, kind of taking a, a little bit, we just started sharing the story of Paul last week, Saul, and uh, now we're going to jump back. Luke is not quite done yet with Peter, so there's still some things we're going to learn and pick up from Peter uh, today and then also next Sunday uh, in, in the book of Acts here, uh, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10 next week. Uh, um, so uh, we're going to look at that. Um, the, in fact, at the end of this passage we're going to look at today really kind of connects well with, with Acts chapter 10 next week, I think, as Peter is, is learning. Um, today we're going to look at some miracles in the Bible, right? And um, uh, these are not miracles done by Jesus or an Old Testament prophet, but they're done by Peter. Uh, Peter's already done some miracles. You know, he's already healed the crippled man. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes we look at miracles in the Bible Sometimes there's this tendency to say, well, and, and we might question and say, well, why doesn't God do that now? And I want to caution us very carefully to say things like that because I, I still believe, church, and I hope that you do too, that God still does miracles today. He's the same God, right? And, you know, and it's, 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 e it's easy to get that kind of a mentality when we read the stuff in the Bible because it's written down for us and we don't have a, like a Bible 2.0 that we can read today and, and, and see what God is in. But we do have testimony. Um, if, if you're interested and maybe, you know, like, well, does God really do miracles today? I want to just kind of give you two uh, authors or two different books to, to look at that if you are interested in that, uh, you know, God does still work miracles today. There's, um, there's uh, two books I would recommend. Number one is a book by Gary Habermas and Doug Guyvett. Uh, they have this anthology of like miracles. They have cataloged like uh, modern day miracles that have happened today. It's a very interesting book. It's, it's thick. <laughs> it might cost you a little bit, but they, they've, they've gone through and done the work and interviewed doctors and, and people that have seen people who have been like healed instantly they, they, and they do there's there's a it's an interesting book um and, and so I just recommend that. And there's another one by Lee Strobel, also called um, you know the Case for Miracles. I mean, he, Lee Strobel has all the the Case for Christ, the Case for the, well, he's done one on the Case for Miracles, and he really presents a, a good argument. So uh, Gary Habermas and Doug Guyvet have a book. I can't think of the book title right now off the top of my head. It's it's an anthology, but if you look up those authors and then also Lee Strobel, those are two good books I think that will kind of open your eyes and open our eyes to. See Yes, God indeed still does work miracles. Um, the, the second part of that might be this, though. It might be, wait a minute. I don't see that in my own life. You know, and we might, we might question, does God still work? Because perhaps we don't see it with our own eyes, right? And, and that's what I want to kind of look at today a little bit with, with us. Um, Let's be careful here. <laughs> um, and, and this is one thing I'm, I'm going to mention. And I'll, I'll come back to it at the end of the, the service. Um, I've heard many missionaries who go across the world and, and share the gospel and, and, and do the Great Commission. You know, they live it out. They have said things like, man, America just doesn't know and doesn't experience what we see God doing in other parts of the world. And, and I said, what do you think, why, why is that the case? Why is that the case? And I think that's something that you and I need to, to ponder as, as believers right here in America. We have religious freedom 
And we have the ability to gather together without threat of somebody coming through our doors and shutting us down because of what we believe. Um, you know, we praise the Lord for that. But many of these missionaries all across the world will come in and say, well, man, God just seems like he is moving extra in, in these extra um, miraculous ways all across the world. And, and sometimes we in America, we kind of like, hmm, why doesn't God do that here? Why can't I see some of these things? Uh, and again, again, caution us. I believe God is doing miracles here. But the question is, is not, church, it's not about God, right? God's never the one in question. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. I, I think it, this might be a question of, of a me thing, a you and I thing. Are, are we trusting God? Are we believing in faith? You know, in the, in the Bible, there, there were times when Jesus himself, the Son of God, God himself, could not, the, the, the Gospels explain this, could not do certain things. Why? Because of a lack of faith, right? And, and, and the Lord chastised the people for that lack of faith. And so when it, when it comes to the American church, I think that's a call for all of us. Do we have the kind of faith that God requires of us? To have a faith that, that opens up the Lord's work in our lives or to do the miraculous, you know? Um, uh, that, that's something we're going to look at this morning through through Acts chapter nine here and these these two miracles here. Uh, but but has a lack of faith on, on my part on your part has it stopped the Lord from working in our lives? Is is this something that because of the culture in America that we've just kind of settled for the kind of Christianity that we have? Or are we missing something? And, and so we're going to look at that this morning as we look at uh, Peter. Uh, here let's uh, let's read starting in uh, Acts chapter nine verse thirty-two. Uh, if you'll uh, stand in honor of God's word, uh, if you can stand, if you're able to stand as we as we read, uh, starting in verse thirty-two. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda. There he found a man named Ananias, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Ananias, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. Immediately Ananias got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which tr when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upper room. Up Lydda was near Joppa, and so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them. When he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the windows, uh, excuse, all the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed, turning towards the dead woman. He said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you for that. Let's, let's pray this morning before I get into the scripture. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I, you know how much I need your presence in my life this morning, Lord. Um, Lord, as we look at this scripture, I pray that you will just speak through me, Lord, and, and open up uh, my mouth, speak through it. And Lord, may I, may I not say anything that you do not desire for me to say, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll take this passage of scripture and you'll open it up to uh, each of us, Lord. Help us to see what you want and you desire for us to, to see in this passage this morning. Lord, 
help us to have the kind of faith that, that we need to have so that you can work in our lives, God. Uh, Lord, we love you and we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, this morning, uh, I've got four points to share with you. Uh, the first three are going to be really fast, <laughs> but and it's and it's um, they're really it's kind of like backwards. These first three points are a, I would call them sub points of the very last point on your on your outline this morning because that is the most important and, and basic thing that we're going to look at this morning. But um, so we come to look at here at this these these two instances of miracles in Peter's life. Um, I think. And in fact, I'll just go ahead and give you the, uh, the, the, the outline point at the very bottom. This is the, 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 if you don't remember anything else, this is what I want you to remember tonight. Go to, the, go to the very last point of your outline. That when people see God working through us and it causes them to turn to the Lord. So I know I just threw the PowerPoint people in the wag. Don't worry about it, Jekai, but you can just stay where you're at. But when people see God working in and through us, it causes them to turn to the Lord. Um, and, that, and that's the main point here. You see these two examples that Peter did a miracle in each one of these persons' lives, and it, that was the bottom result there. It caused people to come to the Lord. And that's where, uh, you know, as we back up now, we'll look at these uh, first three subpoints. We'll, we'll get back to that main point again. But uh, on your outline there, number one, we should be looking for people in whom God can work in their life. We should be looking for people. Uh, verse 33, it says that Peter was the one who found the man. Uh, you know, many times in the Gospels, you have the, the, the bedridden, those who are afflicted, those who are in trouble, who are blind. They're the ones calling out, Jesus, have mercy on me. You know, help, help, you know. Uh, here, you don't see any of that. You see, Peter, he's the one there in verse 33, it says that he found a man. So that tells me that he was looking for somebody that he could minister to. You know, this person didn't call right out and say, hey, hey, here I am. Come over here, help me, you know, you know give me something. Uh, it was Peter, he was the one that was looking for somebody that God could work in their life. Uh, you know, how often do we do that, church? Or are we intentional enough? Do we, do we kind of just go at life thinking, well, I'll just go and whatever hits me is, is what's going to happen, right? Do we kind of have a, a maybe a lackadaisical approach to our life, our spiritual walk with the Lord? You know, well, if, if somebody asks me, then I'll respond. I think we need to be a little bit more like Peter. We need to be the ones looking and, and trying to find people in whom God can work in their lives. You know, uh, we were talking about this in, in Sunday school this morning, uh, as, as it turns out. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times we, we sometimes, maybe we worry about offending people, right? Well, I don't want to approach them and ask them if I could help them or if I could do something for them because I don't you know maybe I don't want to offend them or you know hurt their feelings um, uh, several years ago we handed out food in the community we we took cans of soup and we handed out cans of soup to our community um, later found out like well that would probably didn't come across to certain cultures the way that we thought it was gonna come out there it, it to some cultures that was maybe an offense to take something that I don't need something. But here's the thing, church. We, we cannot let a worry about somebody maybe offending them stop us from helping that person, right? You know, yeah, it, it might be a little embarrassing, but many people, and this is, how, you, you know this, many people in life, we, we're afraid to speak up and ask for help, especially us guys, right? We think, man, we're men, we can do it, we got all this, you know, I'm a man, I don't need any, you know, but sometimes we're the worst ones. <laughs> um, and, but so as Christians... We need to we need to look. We need to be more like Peter and say, who is really out there? Who can I help? Who is somebody that I can pray for? Who is somebody that I can offer to maybe help financially or with a resource that I might have? Maybe I don't have a million dollars in the bank account, but 
I've got a reliable car and, and that person needs a ride, I could offer that person a ride. You know, there, there's many different ways that, that you and I can seek to help people. Uh, and that's what Peter was doing. Um, if, if we're going to be intentional, I think we need to set goals. You know, maybe we wake up every morning or every week. All right, all right I'm looking, Lord, somebody that I can minister to this week. Who's it going to be? You may have no idea who that person is. Maybe, maybe you do. Maybe there's somebody that, that is, is, is sparking that mind of yours right now. There's somebody that maybe that you know that you can help this week. And, and it could be in, in various different ways. It could be a physical help, financial help. It could be a spiritual help. That, that's the biggest thing. That is the best way that you and I can help people in a spiritual way. Now, again, we may, um, Pastor John, are you talking about going to somebody and doing a miracle like Peter? If the Lord leads you to do that, I mean, I'm not putting any limits on the Lord, but are we looking, are we paying attention, are we seeking people that, that need our help, or are we too self-focused that all we think about is me, myself, and I? Or do we have the, the eyes to be able to look out into the world around us, our, our job environment, our school environment, students, are we looking for people that we can minister to and help? Maybe, maybe God just wants us to, to go up and, and offer to pray for somebody right there with them. That doesn't cost you anything but some time, does it? And you never know what the Lord could do that. But are, are we looking for people that God can work in their life? Uh, number two on your outline, every person who serves the Lord serves others for the Lord is important. Every, every person who serves others for the Lord is important. Um, that's what the scripture really tells us about this woman, Tabitha, also known as Dorcas. It's interesting that both those names, Tabitha and Dorcas, mean gazelle. So you think about the deer in the African plain there, you know, just sleek and running. So Tabitha was busy like a gazelle. She was, according to verse 38 here, uh, 36, excuse me, it says, who was always doing good and helping the poor. That's, that was Tabitha's mindset. She was always doing good, always helping the poor. She had a heart for people uh, to help them. Um, again, you know, you see um, uh, verse 39 also explains a little bit about her when they uh, brought Peter to her. The, the, the widows showed Peter all the different clothes that she had made. So apparently we kind of learn that Tabitha was a seamstress and she was making garments for people that didn't have them. That was her, her skill set, what she knew, what she could do, and that's what she was doing. And so I think that's important for us to recognize, too, in our life. What, what skill sets do you and I have? Well, you, you might think, well, Pastor John, I, I can't do anything. I don't know how to run the computer. I can't do the sound booth. I can't, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, let me stop you right there. Uh, those, those are what we call the ants, the ants that come up in our lives all the time. The, what are you talking about ants? The ants, automatic negative thoughts, <laughs> okay? Don't, we got to squish the ants. If you see ants in your house, what are you going to do? You're going to stomp them out and go get the bug spray spray, right? You know, all right, we can't allow those negative thoughts to come into our lives. We got to squash the ants, all right? Uh, let me tell you this. Every single person in this room, right here, right now, you probably have, even though you've never done this or figured it out, you have hundreds of abilities that you can do. And you might, what? I haven't, yes, you do. You have the ability to speak. Many of you have the ability to type on a computer. Many of you have just all these abilities that God wants to use you in his ministry for the Lord's sake, okay? And don't, again, we, well, I can't do it like this, and I can't do it like that. We start, we start 
those ants start creeping up, right? And crawling, we, we have to squish those ants. God has a, a ministry for you and I, each and every one of us. We might not be a pastor, we might not be a Bible study teacher, but God has something for each and every one of us to do, and they're all important, right? This is what Paul talks about in the body of Christ. We're all a part of the body, and every single part of that body is important. You know, we, in a couple of weeks, in about a month, we're going to have our fall festival. And, and this is a, a huge event here at Westside, and, and we could really use all hands on deck. I mean, we, I'll, I'll just be honest with you, last year, it, we, we were a little short in volunteers. It was a struggle. And I was like, man, I wish we had about five or ten more volunteers. Uh, and it's volunteers in, in different areas, in the kitchen, volunteering on a booth, setting up, cleaning up, I mean, just all sorts of things. Uh, and I, I'm asking you, please, you know, consider what, what can I do this, this fall uh, at our fall festival? How can I help? How can I serve? Um, you know, Tabitha, apparently we see that there were some widows around here that were showing the clothes. So did she make some of this clothing? I think we can infer from the text that some of the things that Tabitha was doing was for the widows, right? And it was something that she felt it was like her ministry. Here's the thing. The Bible makes a big deal about widows and orphans, does it not? All right? This, this is huge all throughout Scripture. And, and I just I want to give you, I've got a couple of Scriptures here. Deuteronomy 26, 12. It, it says this, when you have finished setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. See, God had put into the laws an ability in, a, in an area to take care of those widows, the fatherless. Uh, look at Isaiah 117 here. He says, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. And, and again, uh, this is a great passage in, in James 127. The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after or Orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You know, James kind of summarizes the brother of Jesus, and James is summarizing there. He says, "Hey, religion. You know, we, we don't like that word religion today. We think it's it's you know we think well, spiritual, right? But in in their day, that you know, true religion." True faith was, was about taking care of widows and orphans. You know, so, so many people today, we overlook that. You know, so many churches want to get known for things, right? And we want to we see uh, things happen and, and take place. Um, but are we truly taking care of what God deems important and what God cares for most? Uh, and then the la last one I'll give you there is Matthew 25. This is from Jesus uh, speaking in Matthew 25, verse 34. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Um... And that's from, straight from our Savior right there. Uh, you know, are we, church, are we on the same mindset? Do we have this mindset, well, we, we need to do this as a church so that we're known out in the community. That's, that's not what it's all about. It's, it's not about Westside. You know this. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir this morning. It's, it's all about pointing people to our Savior, and it's all about doing what God called us to do. You know, in the illustration that Paul uses about the body of Christ, who is the head of the body, right? It's Christ. <laughs> he's, he's the head. He gets to decide what we do as a church not the pastor not the leadership not the deacons it's christ who sets the order in, in our mission as a church he's the one if, if he says this is what it's important this is what it's all about that is what you and i need to focus on as well too 
Um, you know, it's, it's so tempting <laughs> in our social media world, our 24-7 news media, for us to do things uh, for, for ourselves, right? We, we think, well, you know, I want a spotlight. I, I was flipping through Facebook. I, I can't believe it. I, I tried to go back and find it so I could put it on the screen and show you. But I was flipping through Facebook this week, and there was an ad from a, a lady who says, I will get you on a major cable news TV station in 60 days, or I'll give you your money back. And she was directly talking to pastors and churches. And I'm like, what in the world? So I click on there, just curious. And I was very proud of all the people, the Christians and other people that I saw that were commenting back like, D this is not what it's all about. You know, they were like, if this is really what you think is what it's all about, you, you missed the point. You've got it wrong. Uh, it, it is not about getting noticed or getting on cable TV or, any, or getting on social media or anything like that. That is not what it's about at all. Um, There are many things that churches do, but are they what God wants and desires for us to do? Are we honed in on the Great Commission? Are we honed in on making disciples? Are, are we honed in on, on taking care of widows and orphans like, like, like Tabitha was doing here? This is just, you know, and again, we, we could be talking corporately as a church, but also each of us individually. Are, are we honed in on that mission for ourselves? Is that something that's on our radar? Or are, we, are we thinking, do we have visions of grandeur about becoming an influencer on YouTube or something like that? Are we trying to, to go after the wrong things in our Christian faith? All right, uh, number three on your outline there, we should be willing to go anywhere that we're called to help. We should be willing to go anywhere that we are called to help. You know, the first part here, and the first miracle that was done with Ananias, Peter was looking, and he was doing what the Lord had called him to do there. Well, here, the second paragraph, the second person we see, people get wind that Peter, hey, Peter's nearby. Well, how nearby is he? He's about nine miles, <laughs> you know? So here's a map. You probably can't see that too well. Uh, I apologize. You just walk up here. But anyway, but... Uh, um, Peter, uh, the, the cities that he went to there from Lydda to Joppa were about nine miles apart. Right? And he didn't just hop into his 2022 Toyota Prius and just zip right over there, okay? It was a little bit of a trek, okay? It was a, you know, it took some work for Peter to make the effort to go all the way where he did when he was asked to go. Um, you know, the average person can walk about 20 miles a day. So maybe this was a trip less than a day, but it still, nonetheless, was, was it took some work on Peter's part here. Uh, look at verse 38 there. Uh, it says, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Uh, Peter was willing to go. Um, this, this, miracle that he did with Tabitha you know he he felt like God is moving in this and I need to go I need to go help these people out because of who she was as a godly person a disciple always doing good for the poor so he he decided to go and do that um, this this miracle that Peter did there's really kind of two places in scripture it kind of kind of alludes to or you have very similar place if you go back all the way to Elijah in the Old Testament with uh, the widow and her son at Zarephath uh, Elijah, a very similar thing, goes down on his knees and prays uh, for the widow's son to, to come back from the dead, and he does. But then also more recently, more closely, you, you have in the New Testament, you have Jesus who goes to Jairus' house and, and raises his daughter back from the dead. And it's very similar. So if, I want to encourage you, if you want to go back and, and read those, those passages there, um, you'll see Elijah in 1 Kings 17, and then if you go to Mark 5, you'll see the story there of Jesus and Jairus' daughter. But, uh, but my question to you and I this morning is, is what distance are we willing to go? What, what distance are you and I willing to travel to do the Lord's work? Or 
Maybe it's not a distance, but what, uh, what time are you and I willing to give? Uh, you know, I, I think in America, we, we're, it's easier to give money, right? Well, we, we throw money <laughs> around because we have so much of it comparatively so to, to other places. But the greater thing for you and I to give church is, is maybe perhaps time. Maybe it's our, the, the treasures that we have, not, not necessarily money, but maybe it's the, the resources that God has given us. What are we willing to give? What are, how far are we willing to go? What is the cost that you and I are willing to, to pay to do the Lord's work and allow him to work through us in the lives of somebody else? I was at um, uh, GGC a couple weeks ago uh, there on Thursdays, and there's a Bible study for college students there. And one of the pastors that spoke that um, afternoon came in, and he started greeting the students, and he, he started asking each one of these students the same question. He said, what, what gets you up and going? And the students were all talking about that. And, well, my, I really look, look, look forward to my major and what I'm going to do with my job and my career. And they're talking. One guy, he was, he was wise. He looked, he was sitting next to his girlfriend. He said, my girlfriend. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you got some points there. But, um, but, you know, and they're talking about what really gets them motivated, what really gets them going. I want to ask the same question to you and I. What, what really gets you and I going? What gets us motivated? What, what really moves us to go? You know, we're right here in the heat of college football, and I love college football. Um, I have to be careful not to allow that college football to, to take precedence over my, my faith and my relationship with the Lord. You know, um, and there are things in all of our lives. You may not care about college football. That's fine. You know, maybe it's our family. Maybe it's a relationship that we have where we devote and spend time with a person. But what really gets us going? What gets us moving? And, and I just want you to think about that for just a minute. And, and if, if you feel like it's not the Lord, that he's not the number one priority in our life, what do we need to do? What do you and I need to do to fix that? Uh, you know, we can we can sit here and we can we can leave it right there. We go well. I know I need to to work on that. But what practical things can you and I do to correct that? If if, if our time with the Lord is not as as much spent as watching college football, or if our time. In prayer is not as much as, as as we talk and have relationships with someone else, a family member. What do we do to fix that? You know, we need to be intentional. Set aside some time. Say, all right, Lord, the first 20 minutes of the day I'm going to spend with you. I'm going to get up, get out of bed, get on my knees. I'm going to pray. I'm going to open up the Word of God. I'm going to spend time with you so that, that I will really put you at the top priority of my life that I need to, to put you at. And, and again, this, this all leads back to the last point here, and, and we'll close this morning, but here's, here's the thing, church. When, when you and I, when people see God working in and through us, it causes them to turn to the Lord. That, it made it clear in the, in the two passages of Scripture this morning. Uh, look at verse 35 there. Uh, All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. They saw God working in Ananias' life. He was crippled eight years. And because God worked in his life, Boom! It miracle, and then again with with um, Tabitha, <laughs> she was dead. <laughs> Whoa! You know, some, sometimes I think some of us we're a little bit like Tabitha. We're walking around spiritually dead, and we're like, okay, we're like zombies. It's not the what's the name of that show? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Walking Dead. Okay, yeah. Are we? Do we truly? Yeah. Are, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to the point where people can see? 
a change in our lives there. But in, with Tabitha's life, there are all those in Joppa and all around. Many people believed in the Lord because of the miracle that was done. Uh, going back to what we talked about just a while ago about the miracles, you know, people say, well, God's working in all these other parts of the world, but maybe God is, is not working as much in America. I ask you, is, is that a God thing? No, it's, it's, not, it's not his fault. Is, is, it, is it a me thing? It might be. <laughs> I think it is. Is there something in our lives that is inhibiting God from working in our lives? I mean, I just, I'm going to get real honest with you. This, this week, this sermon, I considered it very vanilla. It was kind of like the Georgia Bulldog offense that everybody's been talking about, right? It's vanilla, right? Oh, come on. You know, um, I'm like, man, I, I spent probably not as much time digging into the scripture this morning as much as I did praying. I was like, God, please work through me this week. Please clean up anything in my life that is stopping you from working in our church or in my life or my family. And I, I think, church, that needs to be the attitude of all of us. Is there anything that is inhibiting my life that, that, that inhibits the spirit working in my life? And, and, and we need to just, you know, maybe the, the invitation that we're going to have here in just a minute is, is just a time for prayer and say, God, Help me, use me, clean me up. I'm a broken, empty vessel that's ready to be filled and used for you. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're going to walk out of here in the sanctuary this morning and, and uh, we're just going to do miracles. I mean, the snow is going to be, woo, turn the, that would be awesome. But it, it starts with you and I looking for people being willing and actually doing what the Lord has, has put on our hearts. Um, you know, and, and so there, there needs to be a, a time of some self-examination. Again, like we talked about last week as we come before the Lord. Um, you know, I, so we're going to have an invitation here in just a minute. And I've seen, you just seen the questions up there behind me on the, the screen there. Are, are we looking for people that God can minister through? And then secondly, are, are we willing to help them? Are we willing to go the distance? And then finally, are we, are we actually doing it? I mean, because we, we can talk all day long right here in the sanctuary. We can talk about our intentions, and we can walk out of these doors today and still not be changed and, and, and do anything different. So I'm just asking you this morning, church, are, are you ready to make a commitment to, to change your attitude, to change the, the way you're looking, to change your willingness, and actually change what you and I are willing to do? Maybe some of you are already doing that, and I, I praise the Lord for that, but some of us might not be. And it's, it's time for us to start serving the Lord this morning. Um, before we, before we go and have our invitation time, the, the, the big question there, the, the million dollar question, as, as someone used to say, is this, is are you ready for God to work in your life? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Are, are you allowing the Lord to work through you because you have a relationship with Christ? If, if you don't, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, For if you believe with your heart that God has raised from the dead and you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Uh, there, there's a point in all of our lives where we have to take the knowledge that we have been given of who God is, who Jesus is, what he did by dying on the cross for us, and we have to decide for ourselves whether or not I believe it and I trust it. Christ for my life. Uh, a few verses later, it says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, maybe you're here this morning and you have a head knowledge of, of about God and about the Bible and the things in the Bible, but you have no personal relationship with God. Are you ready this morning to begin a relationship with Christ through Jesus and God? 
you can do that by saying a simple prayer this morning. Um, you, you see the gospel there, that God created us with a purpose. Our sins separate us from God. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. So Jesus came into the picture, paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose for again. Uh, Romans 8, 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his love in us than this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Are you ready this morning to, to trust Christ as your Lord and your Savior? I just want to ask everybody, bow your head, close your eyes. Nobody getting up and walking out of the sanctuary yet. If you're here this morning and, and, and maybe you have a head knowledge, you, you've been coming to church for a long time now and, and you, you know a bunch of facts about Jesus. Maybe you even believe that God exists. The, the, the book of James says, if you believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe and tremble. But let me tell you, friends, it's not just enough to know that God exists or to, to know facts about the Bible and about who God is. The Bible calls us to trust in the Lord and to place our faith and trust in Christ. If that's your heart's desire this morning, I want to help you with that by, by just helping you through a simple prayer. If, if you would say something like this, say, Dear God, I know that you love me. And I know that I'm a sinner. Today, God, I'm coming to you and I want to place my faith and trust in you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin of trusting in myself and living for myself. Give me eternal life. Help me to trust in you every day of my life. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, we're going to have a time of invitation. And I just want to challenge you. If, if, if today or maybe a week ago, a month ago, you prayed and asked Christ to come in your life, but you've never made that public, would you, would you have the courage to come down here and just shake my hand and say, Hey, Pastor John, I prayed that prayer. I, I accepted Christ. Um, and, and we'll talk to you about what your next steps are as a new believer, a follower of Christ. Uh, uh, for others of you, maybe you've already made that decision. You've already chosen to follow Christ. Um, are, are you looking? Are you willing? And are you actively serving the Lord in, in whatever capacity? You may not be a miracle worker, but are you allowing God to use you just like Peter did? Uh, maybe, maybe you just want to spend some time in prayer and, and maybe the Lord has revealed to you that you're not looking. You're, you're too self-focused. Maybe, maybe you need to be, maybe it's time to go from the good intentions to the actual good doing and, and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to look for one person this week that I can do something for and help a minister. So let's just, let's uh, pray and then we'll have our invitation. Heavenly Father, Lord, this is your time. Lord, I ask that you move in spite of me. Lord, that you move in spite of us. Lord, uh, may those of us who, who need to make decisions, um, may, may you give us the courage to, to step forward, to, to come down and to, to make that public profession or to do whatever you've called us to do uh, today. Lord, we love you and we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand as we sing this last song. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. Accept
Spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? song we just sang would be our our heart's desire this week that, that what, everything we do would be to honor and glorify you Lord uh, everything we do for our family with our family everything we do at work everything we do at school would all be about bringing glory and honor to you uh, Lord may you uh, continue to work through our lives this week and, and Lord I pray that, that you will give us opportunities each and every one of us who are looking uh, for people to, to work in and to, to use uh, our faith, our gifts, our talents Lord may you put people in our path this week that, that you can work in, li in their lives uh, now Lord as, as we come to this time we give our tithes and our offerings to you Lord, I pray that you'll take these gifts and you'll use them. You'll bless those who give, uh, faithfully trusting you with the tithe. Uh, Lord, thank you for how you provided for our church over the last number of, of, of years and weeks. Lord, uh, we trust you uh, with everything because you own it all. Uh, Lord, we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can have.